beginning because I read in the papers coming up here this morning that bean acres have out been outplanted for corn acres or the allocation for bean acres this year in Illinois for recent memory. And Travis took exception to that and said planting is still underway. So I, <laughs> I, I think we have a bet, a wager going here that we can, a little controversy. They're sitting together. There they are. They're sitting together. So that's good. We have our Illinois rotation right, uh, right next to each other. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Evan DeLucia. I'm the Baum Family Director of the Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural IC Critical Conversation, made possible by a generous gift from the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. Led by Joel Friedman, the fund Joel is right here. Thank you, Joel. Um, the fund is the founding benefactor of our institute and continues to gener generously support IC initiatives like this one. The Baum Family Fund is committed to bettering the lives of people through health, human services, education, housing, environmental issues, and the arts, and we greatly appreciate support from the fund. Please help me recognize three people who will be uh, pushing our conversation forward tomorrow. Uh, Madhu Khanna, Madhu, raise your hand. Professor of Agricultural and Consumer Economics and IC's Associate Director. Uh, Praveen Kumar, Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Praveen. And, um, and our event facilitator, Nellie Noakes from Community at Works in San Francisco. Nellie. So uh, what is a critical conversation? In the simplest of terms, it's a forum for frank discussion and creative thinking around the toughest sustainability problems, the kind that have contradictory or ever-changing solution requirements, the kind that don't fall neatly into one industry, intellectual space, or geographic area. Example of these kinds of wicked challenges include how are we going to feed 9 billion people on this planet, how are we going to decarbonize our energy systems, and of course managing non-point non source pollution. These types of challenges require earnest collaboration between industry leaders, governments, policymakers, non-governmental organizations, engineers, physical and social scientists, a big list of people who don't normally sit around the same table. The ambitious goal we have for the IC Critical Conversation is to create an intellectual safe space where, the wide, where a wide variety of stakeholders can share their different viewpoints and priorities, confident that they will be heard and appreciated. In this first conversation, we'll be zoning in on the wicked problem of the growing hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico and the nitrogen runoff from agricultural sources that contribute to poor water quality in the Gulf. Together, we will outline a research agenda, identify uncertainties, uh, look, for, look for ways to find actionable solutions, and identify, identify strategic opportunities for collaborations and building new networks among us. We will seek to research, cert, we will seek to research reach the research community by authoring a policy paper for a scientific journal, and we'll reach the public by submitting a co um, an op-ed piece for a major newspaper. But before we get to that, we have an excellent keynote speaker to help us think about the nitrogen reduction problem and the, and the terms of collaborative sustainability challenges. It's a great pleasure to welcome Jason Weller this evening. Jason is the Senior Director of Sustainability at the Land O'Lakes Sustain Unit which forms a bridge between on-farm conservation and company-led sustainability targets. He leads a team developing the broad portfolio of conservation tools available for the cooperative's mem uh, member owners. Before joining Land O'Lakes a little over a year ago, Jason was the chief of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resource Conservation Service, the nation's largest working lands conservation organization. For five years, he led a staff of more than 10,000 employees across the country working one-on-one -on -one with farmers and ranchers to deliver assistance to protect and improve the quality of their operations and natural resources. He spearheaded an effort to significantly expand NRCS's partnerships with public and private organizations, including agricultural retailers, agricultural supply chain companies, and food companies, to provide innovative and effective services for agricultural producers. Prior to serving as NR NRCS's chief, Jason held various agricultural and nat natural resource conservation leadership positions, including on the House U.S. Appropriations Subcommittee on Agriculture, where he provided oversight and crafted legislation to fund USDA program and activities. 
Jason earned his bachelor's degree at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, and a master's of public policy degree from the University of, Mi of Michigan. We're very excited to have him with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Jan Jason to the podium. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, really appreciate the invitation. Thank you very much for the sponsorship, and I appreciate the invitation from the Institute to be here to talk about um, not just nitrates and nitrogen, but really the, the setting the stage for a larger context of what's going on in working lands conservation in this country. Um, and in part, uh, changed what I'm going to talk about this evening based upon the really excellent program Institute has put together. And I was talking to Dr. Conan uh, earlier um, and apologizing at first, probably uh, a little bit inauspiciously, probably, probably the most difficult speaker she's ever had to deal with. <laughs> in part, she couldn't get me to come up with a title of the talk. Um, and then also challenged me to come up with an abstract of the talk. And so I said, well, in part, what my job is to make sure this is not abstract. So I'm not academic in any way, way they perform. I'm very much, uh, I guess, more of a practitioner in the art of conservation, um, but really want to get into uh, a dialogue with you all. So I have some stuff I want to get through, but then I want to ensure there's time this evening to kind of open it up and, and get your feedback and hopefully enter into a little bit of a dialogue with you all. And I hope then to stimulate conversation for tomorrow's overall, the excellent panels that have been constructed and put together. Um, so in part, the, the title of the talk is The Next Revolution is Upon Us. So in part, uh, I'll, I don't want to be giving you the spoiler here, but what I'm going to be sharing at the end of the day is not, uh, I'm not giving you anyone in this room answers, many of which there are a lot of colleagues and other professionals here who are much smarter and more knowledgeable on a lot of these topics certainly than I am. But what I want to weave this together is show a little bit of the arc of where we've come from and why I think in part the conversations you guys are starting tomorrow are exactly on track and right on target. And we are, I would say, I submit to you, we're in the midst of a change in how we do working lands conservation in this country. And so in part, the, the great panelists and the speakers that are coming here even this evening and tomorrow are some of the best thinkers of the, about this in this space. I think not just here in the Midwest, but here in the country. So uh, I really, again, appreciate the opportunity to be kind of kicking this off. So in terms of the revolution one, so where this all started and where my agency, the agency I used to work for and represent, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, it started two days after this event. This is Black Sunday, April 14th, 1935, right, where a dust storm kicks up in the worst time of the Dust Bowl out of uh, Kansas, blows south across Oklahoma into north the panhandle of Texas. And in my view, forever changed agriculture, at least in this country, if not the world. It started a fire, a global fire, focusing on soil erosion and soil conservation. It was two days after this event where President Roosevelt signed into law the creation of a little outfit called the Soil Conservation Service and designated the first chief of NRCS, Dr. Hugh Hammond Bennett. So Dr. Bennett had been talking about this event, this eventuality, this inevitability for decades. In fact, he was ignored and set aside, actually sent to Central America and South America because they, they thought he was such a crank he didn't know what he was talking about. They actually sent him offshore to let the professionals in soils and agronomy and agriculture really know how to manage soil. Well, he uh, foresaw what was coming because he understood the properties of the soil. He understood then modern agricultural techniques. And he knew we were on a collision course with reality and with nature. So you have these indelible images of the Dust Bowl, right? This is a bygone era, which then initiated this effort to help farmers better steward their soils, right? So what grew out of this, to me, is really generation one. It's the New Deal approach. And this has been with us for the past 83 years, right? So NRCS just celebrated its 83rd birthday last month in April. And so this is a quote uh, from Dr. Bennett in 1939. So it's a few years after the Soil Conservation Service was created. And to me, I thought it really well encapsulated the thinking from that time, that era, that frankly still reverberates today. It's still the ethos and the ethics on how we do soil conservation in this country. So national conservation action must spring from the people on the land and to a large extent be advanced by them as individuals with the help of government. This is a government enterprise. This is the domain of extension and that cooperation with the research community. But at the end of the day, this is through local soil water conservation districts and through the Soil Conservation Service, through the ag research capabilities of USDA, 
right? So in large part, this has been our playbook. And as a result of this playbook, the good news is collectively, agriculture, farmers being paramount, and he was a staunch advocate for voluntary approach. From the, his writings in the 30s and 40s, you can go back and read what he wrote in his books and journal articles. Uh, actually, in the very first issue of the Journal of Soil Water Conservation, uh, he actually wrote about the importance of a voluntary approach, a non-regulatory approach, because he despaired at uh, government regulation. But you still have to have this outreach and extension service of the government. And through this approach, over 80 years, massive accomplishments. So I went in and, and, and drilled into the USDA NRCS data, looked at three watersheds. So the Upper Mississippi Basin, the Great Lakes Basin, and the Chesapeake Bay Basin. And what are some basic proxies for adoption of conservation? So one is, is there conservation there? So through this public New Deal approach to conservation, we actually have pretty good coverage, over 90%. On the Upper Mississippi River Basin, this is data from the mid-2000s, 95% of every cropland acre had at least one practice. Vast majority have a network of practices. Practices could be conservation tillage, it could be structural practices, grass waterways, buffers, you name it. Basic bread and butter conservation. Same in the Great Lakes. Chesapeake Bay Basin, in part because of the focus on that estuary and all the water quality concerns in that area, higher rates of adoption, right? Another metric, conservation tillage, basic good soil stewardship and the footprints of Dr. Bennett. Well, broad adoption, anywhere from 95% in the upper Midwest to around 80% in the Chesapeake Bay Basin. So wide adoption of just good basic, basic fundamental soil conservation. And then structural practices. This is the terraces and the grass waterways and great civilization structures. Again, pretty broad adoption, 66%, two-thirds of every cropland acre in the upper Midwest, which is a huge landmass, has at least one structural practice in place. So by that proxy, there's a lot of stuff that through the public and this partnership and voluntary approach with conservation, working with state and local agencies, we've done a good job just in these three watersheds. And that's the same, it doesn't matter what watershed you go to, this is a, a story that repeats itself everywhere. And yet, we see this through that basic installation of good soil stewardship, what you're seeing is we've been tackling the soil erosion problem. So starting in 1985 up through uh, 2012, what you're seeing are billions of tons of sediment loss being prevented, disappearing from this working lands landscape. So this is an accomplishment that agriculture and the conservation movement should be exceedingly proud of. This is a massive continental scale reduction in erosion. And again, going back to the early 80s up to kind of current era, Huge reduction, particularly in the first couple decades. Broad adoption of good soil stewardship, particularly with the uh, enactment of the 85 Farm Security Act and HEL provisions and other good soil conservation. So good, good activity, but we've plateaued. Notwithstanding massive investments on the public side, right? I'm very proud of what's in the Farm Bill. Farm Bill has been, my hands down, the best public investment. It's the best ecological investment this, this country and the taxpayers make in their well-being and their ability to feed themselves, um, bar none. There's a lot of excitement about other public investments, but the conservation title of the Farm Bill is, in my view, the best investment the public can make, and yet we're not making progress. It's just on the basic issue on soil erosion. And then you have things like this, right? This is an image from NASA, Lake Erie, summer of 2014. This is in early August. So some of you probably recall what happened that summer. But this is a NASA satellite image, and what you're seeing is toxic algal blooms blowing up that summer because of excess phosphorus, dissolved phosphorus, into the, the water systems, the hydro hydrology of the Western Lake Erie Basin. And this is what the shores of the Western Lake Erie Basin looked like that summer. <laughs> Not so good. And this is what it did the wildlife that summer, right? Not good for the water quality, the people depend on that lake, not just for recreation, but also for drinking water. So in this case, those toxic algal bloom was creating microtoxins where you can't filter the water because it's a toxin. And they sent out on August 2nd, this is a New York Times article from August 3rd, uh, do not drink orders, do not shower, do not even brush your teeth with this water. So if you're a governor of a state and you lose water to a, a metropolitan population of a half million people, and you have to call up the National Guard to hand out water. That's, that's bad. That's conservation not working, right? If you're a governor, you're a mayor, county official. And it led to a lot of excitement in the Midwest, but particularly in Ohio, a whole conversation about fertilizer. 
So in this case, a true story. Um, so I was chief at the time, and I was invited out by uh, the Rotary Club of Toledo. They were holding like a crisis event. So in September, they're like, we got to do something. The business community of, of Toledo cannot let this happen again. So they had a crisis meeting, invited in all these speakers, and I had this first like kind of out-of-body experience. So I was invited to represent the federal government and the public sector. What are we going to do? And so I was the first to kind of get up and like, actually, if you compare an Ohio producer compared to an, an average American farmer, the Buckeye guys are actually doing a really good job. Hyper efficient on their nutrient applications, really good on soil management. If you look at their edge of field loss of sediment, phosphorus, nitrogen, you can stack them against anywhere in the country. They are the most efficient. They do a really good job. It's also part of the topography. It's like a form of lake bed, so it's really flat. But bottom line is they're doing a really good job of management. And so my message was, we actually are on a right, right track, right path. Keep it voluntary. We have the tools. We have the technology. Steady hand on the wheel. And so there I was, a federal official from the federal government, from the Obama administration, talking to the business community. So then the next up, the next speaker was uh, representing the Kasich administration, which has a decidedly different view of the federal government. Um, and the, the speaker representing the administration said, forget, literally, forget what the federal government just said. We have a plan, and we're going to regulate. And true to their word, they passed regulation that fall for preventing winter application of manure, which is a good thing, but also no commercial application in the winter, but also no winter application on saturated soils at any point in the year, no commercial manure application if there's a 50% chance or greater of rain at any point of the year. So this is a case where you start getting the state house involved in how to farm because of a, of a crisis where you take decision-making and tools away from men and women who work the land, and you put that into a political environment, it's not the best outcome from agriculture. So this could be any farm field right in the Midwest. This could be here in Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, Minnesota, et cetera. And you look at an event like this, and you're thinking, OK, you, you guys know the story, right? In this case, this is a nitrogen story. In this case, this is a map. You guys have seen this probably 100 times. This is a yield map, not yield of grain or corn or soybeans. This is a yield of nitrogen. And that nitrogen is flowing down the main stem of the Mississippi River and ending into the Gulf of Mexico. In this case, what you're seeing is another NASA satellite image. It's been, uh, the spectrum here is now looking at chlorophyll. So it's detecting plant matter in the water. And you can see from South Texas all the way to South Florida, there's a lot of chlorophyll. So it's not just out the main stem of the Mississippi River. Every estuary along the whole Gulf of Mexico is impaired and eutrophic. But in this case, the dead zone coming out the main stem of the Mississippi River, which is largely fed by nitrogen, excess nitrogen flowing down the Mississippi River, feeds algal blooms, what you're seeing there. And the, the, the current clock goes counterclockwise. So you can see the currents pulling that excess nitrogen across the coast of uh, Louis, southern Louisiana into Texas, feeding the, the algal the matter. The algae die, settles to the bottom, decomposes. The microbes eat the algae sucks oxygen out of the water as part of that digestion process, creates a dead zone where nothing lives. In this case, last summer was the largest dead zone they'd ever measured. So again, notwithstanding the very significant investment on the part of the public to get after this problem, we're not making progress. In this case, the dead zone was 9,000 square miles in size, bigger than the state of New Jersey, largest they'd ever measured. So a lot of that is, again, about flux, uh, weather, et cetera, but yet. But what, from an agricultural perspective, yes, this is not a good, this is not a good success story, right? There's, but no farmer wants this result. This is not something when a farmer goes out and plants, like we just talked about at the outset, they don't think, oh, I'm going to go kill some crab and fish today, right? No, they're thinking, I want to grow a crop. I want to make sure I can make my mortgage payment. I want to make sure I can send my kids to college. I want to be able to retire. I'm worried about grain prices. We'll have my farm next year. Those are the front and center what a farmer's thinking about. So in part, then, what we need to think is how do we shift? Why is this occurring? Now I'm saying the macro level, why is it that we're not making progress? So it's not just the dead zone, though. It's other stories, right? So this is out of Minnesota, where, again, where decisions are being made at the state house. In this case, the state of Minnesota enacted into law the buffer law, buffer rule, some of you may have heard about, where if you have a crop field that's adjacent to a public waterway or ditch that drains the public waters, you have to have a 50-foot vegetated buffer around all sides of the field. Notwithstanding, you could even have a negative slope where it's impossible for water to get to the public waterway because it's uphill, you still got to have a buffer. 
So that's where if you're a farmer and you have a large field and a lot of acreage, you're now taking hundreds if not thousands of most productive acres we have in the country out of production to achieve a perceived public goal, but in the end, scientifically we know it's probably not going to, particularly where you don't need buffers, probably not gonna be doing a lot of good for water quality, right? So this is an example of a challenge when you get, again, politics and state house involved in farming decisions. Uh, out of uh, Wisconsin, cannot apply manure on certain soils, shallow soils, karst topography, City of Columbus last summer, nitrate warnings. Again, City of Columbus, biggest city in Ohio, million plus people do not drink water because of excess nitrogen in the water. Uh, out of the Yakima Valley in Washington State, headline where this is again a bad actor dairy in the Yakima Valley. Some of you are probably familiar. This person unfortunately uh, was not a good steward in terms of managing his manure and had a leaking uh, lagoon that was losing an excess of six million gallons of liquid manure a year in the aquifer, creating a really bad name for dairy uh, in Washington state, but particularly in the Yakima Valley. And this is a recent article. So five years later, they're still, the public is like, Grr, we're angry. And then of course the Des Moines Water Works, right? This is the kind of, where everyone loves to point to, the, the, the shibboleth, the bogeyman, the Kaiser Sose here in the room that people are afraid of. Um, so why is all this? Okay, enough of the bummer news. What, why? In part, we've done a good job of doing the macro level, and now we need to start thinking on a different scale. And this is where a lot of the organizations in this room and the academic and scientific and research community have been on this for a while. My old employer, USDA, has been on this, particularly at ARS, but even at NRCS, um, realizing that in this case, in these, in these three watersheds, you have acres that have been either treated or because of the type of soils that are in place, they're not of high risk of loss, of erosion or leaching or surface runoff. Right? But it turns out there are small acreages in these landscapes where it's more than the 80-20 rule. In some cases, those small acres, so this is out of the Chesapeake Bay region, those high need acres, so those that 4% of the Chesapeake Bay watershed are high need acres, lose anywhere from 10 times to six times more sediment and nitrogen and phosphorus per acre than those low need acres. So we've reached the point on a macro scale of diminishing returns, the law of diminishing returns. We've really addressed the macro issues. And we have lacked up until now the ability to understand where are those fields? How do we identify them? And it's not just the whole field. The game now in the future is gonna be subfield scale, it's micro. And it's not just surface, it's subsurface. So this is to me, we're on the cusp of like realizing, oh, we don't have the tools or the technology to figure out where do we place this conservation to get the biggest return to get after the excess sediment loss, the excess phosphorus loss, the excess nitrate loss. So I submit to you, we are now actually in the midst of it, a change in how we approach natural resource conservation. And it's the convergence, the confluence of public interest with consumer interest with capital interest. And what's empowering all this, the secret sauce is data. So the data revolution is now full throttle flowing in agriculture. And with the data tools we have, the unique financial instruments that are now emerging with interest from capital investments, with consuming, uh, the consuming public and food companies here and in internationally, they all independently are interested in this space, but they all independently don't know how to engage in this space. <laughs> and they need a Sherpa. <laughs> they need experts in know-how who understand agriculture, who know how to web and stitch this all together into an actual functioning system. So bear with me here, I see a lot of frowning eyebrows. So first, let's start with the consumers. So you guys are all aware of this, this emerging change in the consumption, and it's not just the millennials. Um, that moving from a traditional consumer set that's just focused on taste, convenience, um, price. There's now an emerging interest from the consuming public here in the United States, but then globally in other factors, including experience, health and wellness, social impact, transparency, uh, environmental impact. So these consumers are curious and they increasingly expect, particularly in the web enabled world where you can look anything up, they want to understand Oh, they don't, no, no, they don't really care what Farmer Larson did in Blue Earth County, Minnesota to that corn acre. They want to know generally when they're buying something in their product that it was grown reasonably responsibly. 
and that their dollar, their marginal dollar, when they're making a purchasing decision is actually benefiting people are doing the right thing, and they don't necessarily have to drill all the way down that farm acre. So according to researchers, and I will see, but over 80% of purchasers that for food purchases and beverage purchases report that sustainability is important to them. They consider it. Two thirds report, they self-report, that saying yes, I care about how my food and beverages are produced. And roughly close to 60%, which is a surprise, report we will change our purchasing selection if we think it's gonna have a positive environmental impact. And there are these tropes, these uh, perceptions, I guess, about these consumers. First, there are sort of four categories. And again, it's the traditional uh, factors on price and convenience and taste versus the emerging factors. And these emerging factors are like, well, it's just a minority. It's the folks like my, my wife who loves Whole Foods, uh, it's just the Whole Foods shoppers. Well, it turns out, no, roughly half of consumers that are in the grocery stores actually are concerned about all these evolving factors. Well, all right, well then it's just the coast. So I'm originally from San Francisco. It's just the wheatgrass juice nut cakes out in San Francisco, my hometown that love this stuff and love getting there, going to their juice bar, and feeling good with their protein shakes. No, it's actually across, it doesn't matter the region. It's roughly 50% of consumers, whether they're here in the Middle West, the heartland, whether they're in the Southeast, in the Northeast, on the West Coast, it's not a regional issue. This isn't just the nut, uh, nut jobs in the, on the coast, right? It's only millennials. No, it's across all age factors. So this is not just the, the I guess, the Gen Z now is the new thing, or the millennials. So, Gen X always gets lost for some reason. Damn it. <laughs> Can I just have an aside here, speaking as a Gen X, seriously? Uh, I, why do the Gen Xers, I feel like the middle child, right? Mom and dad are always fighting, and I feel like I have to please them and prevent them from fighting and take care of their mess while they drive the whole like, global climate off the edge of the cliff. And then you got the, the millennials who seemingly can't keep a job, but they think they should be boss. And then you have the Gen Xers, actually, as our job is trying to fix everything. But anyways. <laughs> And then it's just like the, the rich folk, right? Against the Whole Food shoppers or their artisanal hipsters in Brooklyn, New York. No, it's across all income categories. Say the evolving factors are important to my food buying purchases, okay? So this trope that this is just something that will go away once the gen millennials get kids and then worry about their, their grocery bill. No, it's not going away. In fact, there's a reason why all these food companies are skating to try and catch up with the puck, not get ahead of the puck. So this is just from a Land O'Lakes experience. These are customers of Land O'Lakes. So Land O'Lakes is the fourth largest dairy cooperative in the country. Rough dairy market right now. And we, our challenge is we need to be able to deliver our milk for our members. We have to ship it somewhere or manufacture it as an ingredient. And this is the continuum of our customers. And they all, in some way, shape, or form, have some form of sustainability program where they're asking questions like, what do you guys do about sustainability, to we actually have a for real sustainability program. If you don't give us data, we're not taking your milk. And so it's no longer now just about a feel-good thing or it's like the right thing to do. It's now the bare-knuckled, this is market access, guys. And so I won't get into what Land Lakes is doing. Perhaps tomorrow folks want to have an aside conversation, but we are trying to now not just be in a reactive mode, we want to be in a proactive mode. I'll talk about why that is, but in part, it's because of this experience. Where now our big customers, because they're responding to the consumer demand, are shifting. So this is the first big touch point. So beyond that then, getting into the micro, out of the macro, into the micro. So it's understanding what the soil scientists in the room, of course, get this, the farmers room, of course, get this, but the soil, the properties, the inherent properties of the soil and the variations in fields matter tremendously, right? So this is a, an image out of Western Lake Erie Basin again, out of Ohio. And this is an actual farm field with different soil types. In this case, it's the Glenwood, uh, Glenwood soils, the red little small inclusion at the lowland area in the field. And this is the Pawama soil in the upperland areas of the field. So a farmer and the way the agribusiness community traditionally looks is, of course, you're gonna have variation in this case of yield. So there's a 50% or 100%, depending on which way you do the math, a variation in terms of yield. This is, again, corn production. So just those two soils alone, that's a, a profitability production conversation with a farmer. But what we have not had is the conversation about risk of loss on those two different soils. So in this case, this is the risk of loss of sediment. 4,000% difference in risk of loss. If you put iron into that little, it's gone. 
it will, it's gone next rainfall, right? And then massive difference in terms of surface loss of nitrogen and total phosphorus. Uh, thousand percent difference, six hundred percent difference, and again risk of loss. So if you apply fertilizer in this low part of the field, whoosh, it's gone in that creek, right? So it's starting to think about oh maybe beyond just like seeding populations, we should be starting to think about variable rate applications of our fertilizers, or how do you spoon feed the crop throughout the growing season? So what, you only apply nitrogen when the crop needs it to burst up that the bushel yield, but not over applying in a way that then increases risk of that nitrogen movement and loss. And then there's this world, the merging, I won't get into it too deep, but soil health, it's like the latest uh, thing, right? I love this quote. So if you guys haven't read his book, David Montgomery came with a book called Growing Revolution. I read this, it's like page 15. I like, my face melted off. Because uh, I think it's the best description of soil there is. So as the dynamic frontier between the living world of biology and Earth's rocky bones, soil is the realm in which microbial life recycles the remains of higher life into the raw materials for new life. That is the most elegant description of soil I've ever seen. I cry every time I see it. So, but what he's getting at here is all the stuff, the livestock that lives at the surface of soil, and we're just beginning to understand. So in this case, an NRCS graphic, one teaspoon of soil has upwards of a billion, in this case, bacteria. If you added up all the living organisms, fungi and protozoa and arthropods and nematodes, it would be close to seven to eight billion, more than their humans on Earth in one teaspoon of soil. It is thriving and alive in an ecosystem we have no understanding of. This is an emerging field, very exciting, on how we put this to work, but also nurture it and bring it back where we lost it, right? So this is the starting of like, huh, okay. It's not just now managing a macro level at a farm scale, it's now managing at a subfield scale, and not just surface level, we now only think three-dimensionally. So this is, bear with me here, I apologize, this is my attempt at being an academic, Dr. Conan, I'm sorry. So this is data here, um, which kind of pulls these together. So this is gonna be infield management plus soil health. So bear with me, this is gonna get a little hairy, and this is the last kind of slide like this you'll see. So what we did is we went out and surveyed 1,000 farmers west of Lake Erie Basin, and we asked them, uh, how are you managing? So we understood their soils, we understood their climate, we didn't know their rotations, we didn't know their fertilizer program, we didn't know their tillage program, we didn't know their pest management program, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we got all that information from like 1,200 farmers. First, we, we uh, split them up, aggregated them to two main groups. So are they gaining carbon in their fields or are they losing carbon in their fields? And then we looked at, within those uh, subsets, did they have a really good nutrient management program or in this case over-fertilized or an incomplete program because they're under-fertilizing? So just looking at that alone, in terms of corn yield, folks that had, whether they over-fertilized or had a really good nutrient management program, were above the statewide average that summer, this is summer of 2012, for corn production. Just the sheer fact they were putting carbon, soil organic matter, back in the soils, feeding those microbes, which are so important to connect the, the plant roots and the mycorrhizal fungi to extract the nutrients out and feed the corn plant, right? But then what's really interesting is when you feed in what they actually did and looked at the data and compared against the average farmer, folks that were, had a really good nutrient management program, in this case for phosphorus and nitrogen, and you compare to these guys that were over applying both, they didn't really get a yield difference, but you look at their edge of field loss, significant difference edge of field loss for both criteria, right? But then you compared them, these guys, to the average Ohioan farmer, pretty significant in terms of they are above, more profitable in terms of yield, more profitable because they're going to be applying less, less input costs. But in terms of what their impact is, then in this case, the uh, Western Lake Erie Basin, different. But then when you look at guys that are doing a poor job of soil health and a poor job of nutrient management, oh no. <laughs> in this case, uh, these guys, incomplete, over applying, they're trying to make up for poor soil management with like, just feeding that, just brain the crap out of that acreage, right? with nitrogen and phosphorus, but you look at, in terms of their yield, no yield benefit, they're still below average, but you look at what they're losing in terms of nitrogen or in terms of phosphorus compared to guys that are doing a really good job. So from a environmental impact statement, to me this is one of these like, oh, okay, here's where the economics starts to feed into and bleed into the converse, conservation conversation. 
So shifting gears a little bit here. So consumers want stuff. They want to know how they're making an impact. They want transparency and insights. We are at, in a scientific conservation community learning, OK, we've crossed the, the macro frontier. We need to get into the micro frontier. OK, so what has been missing, and this is where now the next stage of this comes in, is we need to have private sector know-how and weave economics and finance into this. So this is, I'll just take ownership of this. Uh, I tried and was insufficient at this in my time at NRCS. And NRCS has lost its feel for this conversation. Like they just, economics at, at an agency level is not something they engage or grow or in. They don't, they're not comfortable having that conversation because they don't have the bandwidth, the expertise, the prowess, the tools. So this is where from the agribusiness community and from folks who understand the economics of how to start better communicating with growers about the profitability and the net economic impact of good stewardship and what that means to their sustainability, yes, but then for free, we're generating all the good conservation environmental benefits we want. So in my view, and this is what we're seeing, whether in any industry, but particularly in agriculture right now, particularly with the grain prices where they're at or where dairy prices are at, the future belongs to the most efficient. And to me, conservation really has to be hyper-focused and religious about efficiency. To me, ultimately, that's what conservation is about. It's about eliminating waste. Waste, in this case, is topsoil. Waste is excess nitrogen, nitrogen lost as nitrate, or as ammonia or NOx emissions in the atmosphere. Waste is dissolved phosphorus that should be there to grow the crops, to enhance grain yield, but unfortunately is being lost, surface flow or subsurface flow. Those are the waste streams from agriculture. That is a lost opportunity for the farmer, is a lost opportunity for the world because that, those inputs are not growing food. And that creates a lot of negative things downstream, literally and figuratively. And so therefore, it's our job, collectively, is we need to come up with ways, the tools, and the reasonable way to get after those inefficiencies. Monetize them for a farmer, so a farmer can prioritize, and then give that farmer the reasonable tools to get after and squash the inefficiency. So again, coming back to this, this photo, what I want is a farmer, when he sees that happening, first thought is I'm literally lighting money on fire. So it's interesting, I've had to do a lot of learning in my past year with Land Lakes when I've gone out and visited with growers and with ag retailers, our farmer cooperative network, and we talk about ag sustainability, we have this conversation with them, and they're willing to entertain it, but they're like, oh, well, that's all well and good, uh, Mr. Former Chief, but Let's talk to us about first the cost, because that's all hypothetical. But what is what you're talking about? What's the cost of that? What's the rate of return? When will I see the rate turn? How complex is that? How am I going to feed that into my management system? What new equipment do I do? Who do I trust to talk to to help me figure this out? This is really complex. But let's start with how much does this cost? And I was like, well, I don't know. I'll come back when I figure that out. And then you go to the ag retailer. And this is where farmers every day are going for their agronomic advice because they have agronomic expertise. They're the where, where the farmers get their seed from, their, their chemical inputs, their uh, crop protection products, their in-field, uh, in-season management services. And it's the same <laughs> exact conversation. So you talk to a retailer sales agronomist, and I've had some pretty rough conversations, I assure you. And they go, that's all, that's all great, Mr. Minneapolis corporate guy. But... Uh, What's the cost? Who's going to buy that? How hard is that to deploy on the ground? Does that confuse my sales channel? What's the uh, yield in terms of my hour for selling stewardship versus selling crop inputs and seed? Because I, I can tell you if, if there is a difference I can tell where they're going to put that unit of sales hour, right? Because they're a for-profit business, and they too want to feed their families. And then you go to like my employer, which includes Winfield United as a uh, holding company at, at Land of Lakes. Very eerily simple conversation. That's very interesting, Mr. Weller. But is this a fad? And how much is this going to cost? Who's really going to buy this? And do you understand the economics behind it? What's the rate of return for the farmer? And who's going to help the farmer apply this? And what's the yield on a per hour sales basis for our sales team? I mean, it's a very like. Very focused conversation. The good news is we have a path 
and we're figuring that out collectively. But this is where I think collectively we need to start being really focused. If we want to advance the ball and start bringing together data and conservation and private sector and consumers, we need to be really smart on these conversations. So how do we help farmers identify these opportunities? Again, it comes back to the data. The data is really going to help advance this micro level, subsurface, micro level, level stewardship that's needed. So for example, some of the tools we have include uh, when the sales person is going out in the field with their iPad or laptop, very easily pulling up shape files of crop fields and identifying elevation and, and risk of loss in this case of erosion to initiate having that soil health conversation. We're not expecting every sales agronomist to be a soil health expert, but let's just talk about and marrying up yield and where they're making money in the field and where they're not making money in the field. But let's start with where it's fundamental, which is how they're managing their soil. But then what they're really interested in having that then soil conservation conversation, we can then come up with precision conservation planning tools. Like in this case, where in real time you can build different scenarios. These scenarios, this is out of a, a 200 acre field, North Central Iowa, uh, Carroll County, Iowa, where you can have conventional tillage to a no-till system, cutting that edge of field loss of sediment by over 90%, moving just your tillage rotation, your tillage program. But this uh, capability also allows for different residue management, different crop rotations, incorporation of cover crops. It really puts the producer in control, allowing them in real time to test different scenarios to prevent the loss, not just of soil, but in this case, really valuable inputs. They put a lot of money to, uh, out the door, mortgaged, frankly, to be able to grow a crop. And then it's uh, things we're trying out, like in this case, uh, we have a pilot project with Microsoft where uh, some future date when Skynet uh, becomes sentient, instead of being programmed to destroy humans, it actually will be able to identify conservation. So I'm very excited about that. So in this case, um, what we did is we actually hired some uh, former NRCS employees, and they were sort of like lion tamers with like vir virtual chair and whip, and trained the machine on how to spot conservation. So on the left of these images, so this is contour farm uh, strips or contour buffer strips, grass waterways and buffers and terraces. On the left side is the hand human drawn. So they did a thousand images each of seven different conservation practices, structural practices, because they're easy to pick up initially. And we just want to, can you train a machine to, to spot the stuff? So these are examples of the machines. And we put all that in, and then they had a hack fest, I guess what it's called, and they turned a bunch of smart people loose. And it turned out, this is when the machine spit out. In fact, the machine by and large can spot these things. So can you use then out of satellite imagery, you can identify in a watershed where you already have coverage, where you already have the practices in place. When you go to have a conversation with a farm, you already know what's in the land, so you have a really hyper-focused conversation about which fields he manages need some TLC, where to cite those practices. And then at a watershed scale, you can then cite where that outreach occurs. So you know where the risk soils are, you know where the conservation is already in place, you put those two layers together, you know on whose farm gate you want to go talk to first, as opposed to just kind of shooting blind. Uh, and then I'm not going to get into this uh, within, again, I'm not trying to do a sales job on, on Winter of the United. This is an example of it. Um, Dr. Fraley is going to be here tomorrow. They have amazing technology as well. Every major company out there has these kind of capabilities. But it's using satellite imagery to then uh, understand yield, your, your yield, to understand in real time where there's stress in the field, um, to then do in-season field monitoring, use Instead of like using drones and stuff, you're actually using the plants like little uh, soil moisture probes where you're actually doing tissue sampling throughout the summer and understanding when there's crop stress due to water drought or uh, excess water or uh, micronutrients that are not in the soil that should be there or macronutrients. So then you know how to spoon feed that corn crop or soybean crop when it needs it. And then giving them not just retrospectively rearview manure, but as actually looking forward on when to apply nitrogen at what amount, at what rate, it, it, looking based on weather. So you're putting the farmer forecast into the future control on how to feed their crops. And then a national network of uh, experiment farms that we have where it's understanding the genomes of these different food crops, again, with the purpose of, of helping farmers select different hybrids. These hybrids, I'll, I won't walk you through it, but understanding how each hybrid responds to different soil types in this case but also responding uh, how each, an individual hybrid responds to, in this case, response to um, population, response to nitrogen, response to continuous corn, and response to fungicides. So again, it's understanding what uh, a farmer has in the field, so they then are really smart about their nutrition program, their nitrogen program, or their fungicide program, so they're not over-applying. They know what they got in the ground, and not over-juicing the crop, because the crop can't handle it. That means it'll be lost. 
So we're equipping the farmer with a lot of insights and in x-ray vision and understanding what's happening, not just in his seeds, but in his soil profile. Profitability maps, you guys have seen similar like this. Giving them tools where at the start of the season what their max yield is based on their hybrid selection. And then throughout the season, growing season, giving them insights into really what the prediction is on their yield. And there's a gap and you've already lost acreage because of weather or because of management decisions a farmer makes. And so then giving them tips on getting back on that gap, how to chase that bushel yield, but again, putting them in control to grow food for us. So then how do we upgrade? So how do we come to bring this back to conservation? So it's weaving together the consumers, it's weaving together data technology, it's weaving together the public agency interests and capabilities, and it's bringing to the fore other private sector capabilities. So again, this example, what we're trying to do at Land Lakes and is going through our channel. And what you're seeing here is both in Canada and the United States, we are building a network of some of our largest, most progressive retailers, which have very advanced uh, nutrition programs and precision ag capabilities. And we were turning them into advocates and leaders in sustainability, where we co-design with them sustainability programs that are run out of that retail shop. So it starts with good nutrient management, but we really then are bringing the whole soil management, soil health component to this. And we're bringing data solutions to them as well, but we wanna then help drive a targeted, focused conversation with a farmer about how to advance stewardship in their farm fields, and then understand where they started at, and over time as farmers adopt practices and products, what was that positive both yield and profit impact for that farmer, that's front and center, but then also capturing what did not happen? In this case, loss of carbon in the atmosphere, loss of nitrates off the tile line, loss of topsoil off the edge of the field. We also, uh, a lot of folks right now are very interested in this space. This has emerged in the last five years or so, where food companies, the whole food value chain, so from ingredient manufacturers to processors to consumer packaged good companies to grocery store chains, are very interested in this space. So how do we tap into this growing interest? and harness the power of the international consumer to drive back up the value chain to the farmer and incentivize, ultimately, good stewardship, but also uh, to send the signal that, yes, it's important to chase that inefficiency, inefficient use of fertilizer, the poor management of soils. So in this case, Lana Lakes, we have partnered with Walmart. We're part of the Gigaton Challenge. We have partnered with Campbell's. We actually have a pilot project in the Chesapeake Bay region where we're helping them source sustainable wheat for their goldfish crackers. Um, we are partnering with Smithfields as part of their overall uh, pork production, swine production program. Kellogg's as well as they're looking at sourcing wheat for their products. And there are other partners that we're also engaging on the food value chain. But this doesn't happen. This is not a land of lakes, like I'm not here to, to spike the football and do the icky shuffle in the end zone. This is like, uh, this doesn't happen with this broad partnership of state agencies like the Minnesota Ag Water Quality uh, Certification Program. Environmental Defense Fund, the Nature Conservancy, um, Field to Market, Iowa, uh, I could go on and on, Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I mean, the list is actually, it's huge. And so we are but one small player in this, and it's starting but collectively zeroing in on the target on how we then bring our shared resources and agronomic expertise, financial and economic expertise, and conservation expertise together to go to work for the farmer. And then there's also then the whole, like what everyone's really excited about is the whole finance industry. So there's a lot going on in this chart, I know it's busy. Just look at the, the direction of the arrows. On the left side, this is private capital committed to conservation. This is sort of like big C conservation. So I don't think ag, this is like environmental quality. So from 2009 to 13, on average, uh, they had about 800 million invested a year. And just in the last two years, this has surged uh, a compound annual growth rate of close to 60% to now $2 billion invested. This is probably way undercounted. But then you look in the public sector. So this is probably including a lot of um, USDA's programs as well as uh, USDA's programs at a federal level. Flatline. And this is uh, three years out of date. I assure you, it's a very different figure right now at NRCS. So there's a, there's a disinvestment that's occurring at the federal level. There's a disinvestment that's occurring at the state level for good rational reasons in terms of uh, finances and the government and the public sector. So the advent of the private sector and how to put this capital to work that's hungry, that's looking for deals, that's looking in a way to invest and make an impact, a social environmental impact, but they also want their money back plus interest. So this is a very much a business proposition. 
how do we put this money to work for agriculture, for farmers, but also for work for the broader environment? Again, similarly, this is another side that looks at public capital investment, private capital investment. On the public side, again, this is probably looking mostly at EPA investments like uh, the Clean Water Drinking Fund and other uh, water quality drinking revolving funds. A very significant investment on water quality, collectively $9 billion over this time period in 2015. Um, over these three years, I should say, uh, age categories or year categories. Private capital, very interested in fuel fiber. The money, the smart money, is going not into water quality projects like drinking water or municipal water supply. The, water, the money in this case is hungry for deals in agriculture, in food production. So how do we put this to work? This is another example pilot project, and there's gonna be a panel talking about this tomorrow. Um, this is an example we're working on where we are trying to come up with a pay for success environmental impact bond. We're talking to municipalities in Iowa um, where we want to create with those uh, municipalities, they themselves um, have discharge permits they need to get to get the water quality to where they need to. There are updated permits, very expensive, very capital intensive. So can we then use impact bonds who are willing to invest into a structure where then they can take that capital, go upstream, work with well, ag retailers that know how to talk to farmers, go work with farmers to go put in place good green infrastructure, but also better fertilizer management and soil management practices that then we can quantify what that impact is, that then provides the credits back to the municipality for which they can then, uh, because they have reduced rate payments, they can now pay back the bond. So we're trying this, this is but one path. There are a lot of smart people trying to figure this out. This is but one example. But I think this is, again, a frontier. If we crack the code on this, the potential to scale this is, is significant. So I've done a lot of talking at you hypothetical. I want to shift now actually into, into the reality and why I'm actually really optimistic. I'm more than glass half full. Like, we know how to do this. And there are examples that are right in front of our eyes. And you don't need to have a water quality monitor to, to, to test the water to know it works. But we're going to start there first. So this is an example out of northern Minnesota, full of the lakes. Impaired, listed as impaired, which is a fancy way uh, of saying the water is not very good. Um, but the state of Minnesota, too much phosphorus and sediment in these lakes. So using basic conservation practices, but they targeted, they knew where those fields were, what practices exactly they need in those fields. This is an example of targeted converse, uh, conservation. In a period of just uh, eight years, they significantly crashed the excess phosphorus loading in those lakes dropped it uh, like over 70% to the point where the state was able to delist those lakes from the state water quality impaired list. Moving to Oklahoma. Oklahoma has been a master at this over the last uh, decade or so. In this case, um, Pond Creek is an 80 mile stretch of a, a system that was impaired for turbidity, which is a big word for dirty, and uh, bacteria, uh, E. coli, which is not something you generally want in water. Um, and in this case, back in 2006, exceeded the red line, red line being the Oklahoma State Water Quality Standards. Again, use a targeted conservation, knowing where you had to go, which ranchers and which row crop farmers you had to talk to, install basic conservation practices, the kind of things we've talked about over the last uh, 45 minutes or so. And then again, in just uh, a few years, quickly recovered that ecosystem, that watershed, back to high water quality standards. Anyone with this is? Yeah, the Arctic fluvial grayling, but you know because you've, you've seen this fish about 8,000 times. So this is a success story out of Montana. This fish was down to uh, a 50-mile stretch in the Big Hole Valley and Centennial Valleys of, of northern Montana. And it was uh, on its way out, like not many fish left. And this is an example where, again, targeted conservation. And often, wildlife is the best measure of environmental quality. You don't it's oftentimes the most inexpensive measure of environmental quality. So if ranchers went out, it was just 30 ranchers, put in place good stewardship practices on 150,000 acres of rangeland, fenced out the creek, put in uh, water diversions for cattle so the cattle weren't down in the creek and, and they did some riparian restoration, brought this fish back from the brink of extinction to the point that um, my colleague at the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Dan Ash, went out and took this fish off the endangered species list, or actually the candidate list for listing. It was a very significant event, because this was like almost a shooting deal up in Montana. Guys were pretty bent out of shape about the fish. But it's not just this, it's also now, John, do you know what this is? The Ar this is the Oregon chub. Oregon chub should be wearing a cape. 
because this is the first fish in American history to be actually be taken off the endangered species list because of proactive, focused investments in conservation. So working with uh, landowners in central and western Oregon, they installed, again, good conservation practices, restored wetlands. This fish was down to a few hundred chub. Within 10 years, there were like 100,000 chub and growing, taken off the endangered species list. Come on, that's like the money shot, guys. You guys, <laughs> guys need some coffee, Dr. Khan. He's like, get the, he's fired up. This is a Louisiana black bear. This is the teddy bear that President Roosevelt couldn't bring himself to shoot. You can see why, right? Well, she's looking pretty cute. But she was kind of bummed out because just a few years ago, there weren't very many of her left. They're down to like 200 or less. Again, targeted smart conservation, reconnected separated populations, brought back hardwood uh, bottomland ecosystem. Today, there are a thousand of these black bear back in population and surging population, where again, Secretary Jewell flew down to Louisiana and delisted the Louisiana black bear from the endangered species list. Um, New England cottontail, Peter Rabbit, literally Peter Rabbit has written about New England cottontail, taken off the candle list because of targeted focused con conversation. Sage grouse, same exact story. I'm not gonna bore you with the story. You guys get the rhythm here, right? This works and we've seen this time and again across this country where you get good willing people together with the right resources using science, in this case, a lot of data and technology, not triage the population, but to target where you can make a difference. Nature responds if you give her a chance. The biggest success story you all should be writing about, this is like a thesis, Dr. Kana, you should have your students working on. This is the hugest success story in ecology restoration in America, and no one's talking about it. So this is at Chesapeake Bay, and I got so frustrated about it when I was at NRCS. I uh, actually uh, commissioned this study. So in this case, it was um, working at USDA, representing NRCS, but also agriculture in Chesapeake Bay. A lot of right, people rightly are concerned about bay water quality. Got it. Unfortunately, agriculture was continually being held up as the villain. In this case, the guys are poisoning, polluting the bay. But I, we kind of knew actually agriculture was doing a lot. So we went out and we had a baseline survey of growers across the Chesapeake Bay region. So those who don't know the geography, it covers six states. So from uh, northern or I guess central New York, most of Pennsylvania, a little bit of West Virginia, almost all of Maryland, half of Virginia, and a little bit of Delaware, right? So huge geography. Uh, six million acres of production agriculture in that watershed. A lot of agriculture, very important part of the rural economy in those areas. And according to US EPA, if you care about the Chesapeake Bay, your interest is in keeping that landscape in agriculture. So in this case, we went out and we compared what was in place in 2006 for conservation versus what was in place in 2015 for, our, for conservation. And over that time period, farmers voluntarily installed conservation practices on close to 4 million acres of production agricultural lands, which is a huge investment on their part, but also on the public's part. So, all right, so what? What happened? Well, we estimate that edge of field loss of sediment was reduced by close to 60% compared to what was already in place. So you already had good level of stewardship, a further reduction in edge of field loss by 60%. All right, so, so what? Well, that sounds like a lot. Well, that's 15 million tons of topsoil no longer flowing in the tributary of the Chesapeake Bay. If you loaded that on a coal car, that coal car would stretch from Annapolis, Maryland to Albuquerque, New Mexico, every year, no longer being delivered in the Chesapeake Bay. Phosphorus reductions, upwards of 40%. Uh, nitrogen reductions, upwards of 30%. So that's hypothetical, that's, that's great, Weller. So what? Well, the so what is, according to the US EPA, between 2009 and 2015, they actually measured water quality changes in the Susquehanna, Rappahannock, the main rivers flowing in the Chesapeake Bay. And they then allotted across different sectors who contributed to that cleaner water. Well, for sediment, it was one sector alone that did the lion's share. 76% of the measured sediment loading reduction was delivered by agriculture. Phosphorus, over 50% of the measured phosphorus reduction was delivered by agriculture. We have some work to do on nitrogen, hence the critical conversation, but made progress nonetheless. So what did that mean? So I was literally cutting out of the newspaper uh, success stories, where I like, literally, Bay Journal, Washington Post, uh, Bay Sentinel, all these guys that love to talk about agriculture and how agriculture is destroying the Bay. But there was success stories like uh, bass, anchovy, um, surging in populations in the last five years. 
like triple, quadruple in size, to the point where um, you had dolphins sighted off Annapolis. Like literally Flipper was coming up the Chesapeake Bay by the state house like, yo, what's up farmers? Thanks for cleaning the water. You had seagrass coming back at levels they had not seen, way ahead of schedule. Like the scientists were like, there's too much grass. Like this is not according to our charts and maps. This, this submerged aquatic vegetation should not be here. Why is that? Because there's less sediment, less uh, algal pollution in the water, allowing more uh, solar energy to penetrate the water and actually grow submerged aquatic vegetation. Why should farmers care about that? Because those are the nurseries for fish and for blue crabs. Well, it's to the point where the watermen were complaining about the price of crabs. The price of crabs are crashing because there are too many blue crabs in the Chesapeake Bay. So grab the watermen who are the farmers of the water like farmers cut it out. You're killing our business, right? Oyster populations are coming back. Um, the hypoxic zone in the Chesapeake Bay was the smallest they'd measured in like 20 years. It went on and on and on. So I'm not too smart, but you just kind of connect the dots. You're like, huh. I wonder what happened in this ecosystem. Agriculture, targeted conservation, focused energy, partnerships are recovering the largest estuary in North America. But beyond natural resources, I promise you I'm closing, this is also about people, okay? And this is to me why this is so important. And this is beyond economics and finance and conservation practices and soil types. This is about folks like Jay Tanner who's a seventh generation rancher out of northwestern Utah, who's been on that land. His family's had that since the 1870s. It's about keeping him intact, having a viable herd, being able to stay in his land, but also not have to worry about the fear of regulation. Right? This is about the Shadowin family, Jake and John Shadowin, beef producers out of central Kentucky, who are now soil health stewards and leaders in their community, teaching other livestock operators on how to improve the health and the vitality and resiliency of their pastures. Here in Chicago, I went to an event. I roll in the event and literally they had this sign up and I was like, uh oh, this is not a typical NRCS field day. <laughs> so uh, very proud of this and some of you in the room should be proud of this too, uh, starting with the University of Illinois and uh, Illinois Corn Growers Association. This is an example. It doesn't just have to be a rural enterprise. This is the uh, Urban Transformation Network a partnership of 10 churches, USDA NRCS, Illinois Corn Growers Association, University of Illinois Extension Service, the city of Chicago coming together and taking vacant lots, turning them into production agriculture, putting in place investments then that are training young students, young children in their churches, some of whom have actually gone on for degrees at University of Illinois in agriculture out of this program, out of Westside Chicago, this food coming out of these gardens, going into the nutrition centers of these churches, feeding people, particularly in the summer months, school kids who go hungry because they don't have access to nutrition programs. It's a virtuous circle, putting community development and integrity forefront, but conservation is the kernel that brought it all together and is making it happen. Southside Chicago, clearly wasn't dressed very well for that field day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of thing where I got in the car and the NRCS team's like, we're going south side. I'm like, where, what, what's going on? Dr. Uh, Emmanuel Pratt, uh, an, ar uh, an architect, came back to his community, south side Chicago. And this is almost like a, it gives me chills to talk about it. This is uh, poetic. We're standing in a field where it historically was a juvenile correction facility. So for young men, this is really the last stop. This is where hope ended for a lot of folk who went into the correctional system. And today, this former correction facility is now a verdant farm in the middle of Southside Chicago, where he's growing abundant, high-value crops that we may even eat tonight for restaurants in downtown Chicago. Conservation is what's empowering this field. And now young men, instead of coming, the last stop of hope, this field is now the first start of hope for young men in his community that are, instead of being out there involved in some stressful situations, have a place to come, learn carpentry skills, learn agricultural skills, a place of safety and rest, of respite. And in closing, um, something you can't value, I'm now back in the Chesapeake Bay region. Uh, the owner of this farm, Aspen Grove Farms, uh, Janet Gale Harris, uh, her family goes back 
having owned this property back to 1763. So, I mean, this is a heritage farm. The roots are deep. And I was there, to, to talk, we were launching a, a Chesapeake Bay effort that day, and it was raining. And you can see the tree line there. Um, that's on the, she calls it Muddy Creek. And that, that's been called that since colonial times, since her family's owned that. And so it's for as long as there have been European settlement and colonial activity and now production agriculture today, it's been known as Muddy Creek. Well, the day I was there, it was raining. That water was crystal clear. I mean, it was beautiful. She has a black Angus operation, about 75 head of beef production. Really proud of her operation. You can see from her pastures, I mean, this is gorgeous. But to me, what was really poignant, and again, it comes back to the value of what we're trying to figure out here of why this really matters. Why this to me is so poignant and important that this is about keeping intact a, uh, a lush and diverse American landscape where you, it's very hard to put value on things. In this case, uh, after this event, we went back to her homestead and we're you know, having tea and, and talking. Uh, and she said that recently they had been renovating her, her farmhouse, original, and they pulled up the floorboards and they found the original floorboards. Um, and the floorboards of her house were bloodstained. And I'm like, why is that? Well, she said, well, in the winter months, when she looks out her kitchen window across her fields, you can actually see divots in the, in the pastures. I'm like, why is that? It's like, this is where the Army of the Potomac bivouacked in the Civil War. So you still have this, like, this imprint of one of the worst epochs in American history is still alive. And that, that part of that history, that connection to that landscape is still, still alive. And young men died on her farm, in her farmhouse, trying to keep this union intact. How do you value that memory, that experience? You can't, it's immeasurable. But it's conservation that's keeping that farm in business today. Keeping it from being prevented, from being literally paved over and converted into a gas station or a pawn shop or whatever, the gross exurb development that's coming up the county road. So, you know, this is an acuity test, Professor Coppus. Is this a sunset or a sunrise? I say to you, it's both. So we're leaving a time period of a New Deal approach to conservation that has done tremendous good, and there still is absolutely a need for the public sector. I don't want to say we're replacing or supplanting. Cannot happen with the government. Cannot happen with extension. Cannot happen with small water districts. But they alone can't carry the ball where it needs to go next. Cannot do it. And there's so much stress we're gonna be putting on our production system, our soils, our communities, our water quality, our estuaries, our forests, our prairies, et cetera, in the coming 50 years to feed nine billion people that we also need a different way. And so I also see then a sunrise of opportunity. And it was forecast, coming back to the future, Dr. Hume and Bennett. In this case, writing um, 1959, and the view that the deficiencies in the farmer's temporary stewardship over the land and the public's permanent interest are very likely to contribute to the soil impoverishment. And to him, this was a concern, because if you impoverish the soil, you impoverish the ability of a country, of a people to feed itself. And so you guys have to figure out tomorrow on how to ensure there is no deficiency in either that short-term or long-term interest. So with that, I will cease and desist. Thank you for your patience and your attention to me. Yes, sir. I'm dealing with a lot of the private companies. Uh, they've been giving farmers a lot of management advice for a very long time. Um, and farmers who I talk to know that a lot of it is nonsense. How do they regain credibility? So the credibility, particularly in the current economic environment, is if you can't, if you do not prove you have the farmer's economic bottom line at heart, you lose the business, full stop. And this is a big deal, particularly for not just Winfield, but really for those local cooperatives and for the ag retailers. Uh, and there is a shift that I'm seeing, I'm not speaking for that industry, I'm just now a participant in and kind of an inside, uh, more like flotsam. There's the ties going in and out, I'm gonna observe what's happening. Um, but there's an absolute economic shift occurring. And there's the advent of the virtual co-ops who are now competing on price. Um, farmers have had bad experiences in the past. 
and the co-ops, but also Winfield United itself, uh, realizes and is, is now making investments that it's now not just the crop year relationship. It's now not having a conversation about what you're doing for crop year 18, what's your planning program and, and scripts and seed rates. It's what's your program for 2020, 2023. It's about a long-term investment of relationship. And that map I had up there of those progressive retailers, that's one of the first things they say. Why do you sign up for a sustainability program? If, particularly if it means in the short term you may sell less of something, a bulk commodity that they used to use to stay in business. Um, they realize that it's better for their farmer customer if they provide that, the correct agronomic advice, that you then have a better long-term relationship because that farmer, you improve the trust in that business relationship. Really great talk. Thanks. I learned a bunch. Um, I was struck by two things. Um, the um, example or the really important success we had with um, erosion in the 30s, um, that's a little bit further <coughs> to me, I, I think, than the nitrogen problem. When you lose soil from your field, that is your soil that's being lost, and you're feeling the pain of that from not having that productivity in the future. It's very different than the nitrates and nitrogen conversation that we're here to have. Mm -hmm. Um, once those a little bit put on the field or however it's done, it runs off. The cost of that is largely borne by people elsewhere. The second thing that relates to that is that the huge successes you showed in, 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 um, in on uh, phosphorus and sediment um, in the Chesapeake Bay and the conservation effects assessment project that NRCS is part of has also very much demonstrated that in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Those are phosphorus and sediment, and the practices that I understand from agronomists and ag engineers that we're really going to need to change and keep nitrogen on the landscape are a whole different group of things and may have much higher costs on a per acre basis. And therefore, the kinds of things um, that, we, that have worked with phosphorus and sediment may not be as effective. Any thoughts about that? Or? Yes, uh, you're right. But I would even challenge you on the, on the soil part. Like farmers generally don't see erosion, and frankly, most don't care. So it's not even on erosion, it's a challenge. But at least that you can visually see. But a lot that uh, is not an issue. For, I mean, it depends, again, on topography. If you're in uh, East Kentucky, East Tennessee, yeah, those guys get it, right? They've got like an inch of topsoil. Right. If you were in central Iowa or central Illinois, whatever, not my problem. So it's, it depends on the geography. But um, point taken on, on soil. Uh, and that's a little bit of my talk, but the point I was trying to make is that things that you, we can visually see and experience but also measure uh, pretty efficiently, we are pretty good at tackling. Phosphorus we haven't figured out either. And it's like this, the science around dissolved phosphorus is just like emerging. We, we really don't understand how that molecule moves. And the same with nitrogen. Nitrogen is an ex extremely squirrely molecule, right? Very difficult to manage. And it's not just a, in its soluble form. It's also as a gas. And it's, it's, it has huge environmental impacts. But I would challenge you a little bit on the farmer doesn't care. Because if you tell a farmer, it, so here's your fertilizer bill. And at best, 50% of this bill is going to be wasted. It's lost. Like, you might as well just burn that cash. Like, that, the farmer doesn't feel good about that. And that is something that absolutely hits their pocketbook. And that's using basic level of nitrogen stewardship. So if you can say, through better uh, micro-applying, split application, foliar application, stabilizers, other additives that protect it, prevent it from loss of the atmosphere, um, so you're avoiding the loss at the outset. Yeah, it's upfront going to cost a little bit more, but in volume sale, you have to buy less. And by the way, we're also going to have more grain coming out because you fed that crop when it needed it. And now you can reduce that loss and you increase, increase your nitrogen use efficiency from having two pounds per bushel or one and a half pounds per bushel down to 0.7 pounds per bushel or 0.6 pounds of nitrogen per bushel. Like that, where you really get to hyper efficiency on nitrogen. Uh, bottom line, he's going to have more profitability per acre, and you're going to have less risk of loss. I'm not saying you're eliminating the loss. So then there's these other practices you're kind of referencing. But this is where then you need other instruments, where the farmer is not going to pay for, by and large, unless they're really unique, 
a bioreactor or uh, a multi-stage ditch or uh, the special uh, buffers that you put in place, saturated buffers. Um, because those are very expensive and they don't have an economic interest in capturing that nitrogen. And so yes, they paid for it up front and that's an economic hit. And if that is not good, uh, it comes back to the efficiency conversation. And guys that are really inefficient with their nitrogen are probably not gonna be in business five years from now. Guys that are really good at managing nitrogen are gonna be growing and buying acreage right now. But at the end of the day, if uh, the public has an interest in getting after that next marginal gain, there's gonna be then, this needs to be a public-private investment. And there needs to be expertise and data and science to where to cite that infrastructure to get the biggest return. So it's, it's a all and yes, all and above. But expecting farmers to, to, to shoulder that, then the answer is gonna be, you'll have this conversation again in 20 years and not make progress. Yes, sir. You had an interesting map of two soils, one blue, one red, I think it was in Chesapeake Bay. And then there was this one red area, the soil map, the red area control, contributed much of the pollutants. Yeah. Without regulation, how do you, I mean, this is a property rights issue, telling that farmer what they can do, right? And I mean, the obvious suggestion is, don't farm that. I mean, just, it's a little piece, just don't farm it. But that's their property. How, right. do, you, how do you deal with that property right issue um, with or without regulation? Uh, my personal experience, my personal view, uh, but also having seen some of this play out, you approach that conversation very delicately and you don't make it a regulatory conversation. Because uh, that's the first, as soon as you even open that conversation up, you are uh, escorted off the operation and not invited back. So, I mean, see uh, Waters of the United States, which was a big to-do in the last administration. Uh, I won't even get into the, the politics around that because I'm going to get in trouble. I'm being recorded. Um, I have a lot of personal views to talk about that over cocktails later, but that's an example of how you can excite an entire industry and an entire countryside over an issue and to what effect. So it comes back to economics. And if you can show that producer, that he probably knows it's a low producing area, but he's not tracking the, the seed cost, the fertilizer cost, the diesel fuel cost, the equipment wear and tear cost to go down there and clean it out and to plant into it and fertilize that, that small exclusion at the bottom of the field. But if you can come back and easily show, okay, if you actually don't even plant that, just let it go to seed literally, or enroll it in a, a, a USDA program where you can actually get um, into a conservation reserve program. You actually get a payment for it. But if anything, you're frankly bottom line, better off, don't even just let it go. Uh, that's hard for producers to do. But if you can show, because uh, they, at the end of the day, they're, they, wanna, they want their lands to be as productive as possible. That's how they grew up, that's how they're trained, and that's what they experience in the marketplace. And they can't track at a fub, yet at a very effectively at a subfield scale that profitability in these zones. So now we have the ability and the technology to start to put the farmer in control and manage his fields like a true business, where he's managing portions of the field with a rate of return. And if you have a, a part of your field that is poor performing, a poor performing business unit in that field, then you manage it like a business and you don't put capital and operating money into that part of the business. Um, and so the farmers that understand that, again, are the ones who are gonna be super efficient on their fertilizer, ultimately gonna be on a per acre basis a lot less impactful, and frankly on a per acre basis much more profitable. So what we're trying to bring to this conversation for that one example is start from a profitability conversation. And um, don't overwhelm, I mean a lot of these guys are very sophisticated and very smart, I don't mean to be pejorative, but you don't come in with like 100 sheets and maps and stuff, you start with just let, let's have a conversation about how your field's performing and we, where are you not performing? What part of your field is, whatever reason, gets drowned out or you get low yield? Well, let's, let's talk about why. And then from there, you can then start to talk about, well, let's come up with other options for that low performing unit. Yeah. You talk about you know, the, the role of consumer and, and um, stewardship and so on. But to what extent is that really going to be effective in the case of nitrogen, which is, 
applied so far upstream from the final product that the consumer is seeing in the grocery store. It's hard to figure out, uh, you know, whether any of, say, the Lando Lake products are produced with less nitrogen or more efficiently use nitrogen versus not. So how does that information, and is that going, you know, is that ever going to be transmitted to the consumer, and would the consumer be willing to pay for that, and can it actually drive change, you know, that far upstream? Short answer is, is I don't know. Um, uh, my hope, again, my sunrise image in my head is I hope so, uh, and that's what we're trying to figure out. So there are companies that, um, it looks like you want to jump in or I don't want to. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be real quick and then let, let you go. Okay. Um, so coming back to Whole Foods, Whole Foods believes it's actually presenting produce in this way where it, it thinks it can actually uh, drive sales, particularly on their fresh produce because they're now, uh, a lot of their stores have marketing materials out there about how the produce was grown and they have different ratings, both for produce and for uh, animal products, animal protein. Um, there are some of the companies that we talk to who actually want to have on pack labeling. So they actually want to label on their packaging, come up with some kind of label or, or signal. So beyond fair trade coffee, I mean, they want to get into some way to signal that the ingredients in this product, whether it's a cereal or some other grain product, um, was grown in a way that reduces impact on the climate and it reduces impact on water quality. Uh, and there are others that not necessarily will know they don't want to create that issue on their packaging. So we don't want a label, but we want, we have made to our shareholders because we're publicly owned. Uh, and frankly, a lot of our investors, um, coming back to that capital issue, where it's, how's capital is deployed, they have some very tough boardroom conversations about whether they can um, get access to additional equity if they don't have a sustainability program. And so now investors, not just like family funds, but now like very significant investment operations are having these very direct conversations with very, very big food companies. And so beyond it now just being a bumper sticker slogan, like we're, we, we like nature, they now you'll see across a lot of these different companies, very stringent, particularly around climate change because of the Paris Accords, goals. So how that flows to an, a product in a store, probably not, but from a brand um, consumer experience and association, but really, again, coming back to just bottom line finance and economics, they want to get access to Wall Street and increasingly Wall Street saying, until we understand how you're managing your sustainability and your risks, uh, that's going to be a hard conversation. So now they're very interested in like, well, how do we reduce NOx emissions? That's going to be a real tough set. Nitrogen isn't growing tomatoes. It's not growing grapes. It's growing corn. It's coming from corn, and corn's going into ethanol and beef. Ethanol's a whole different conversation. You've got to figure out, and you've got to prove that whoever grew the corn did it according to some sort of practice, and so someone's going to have to monitor it. And then you've got to go from there to the person who's producing the beef, et cetera, et cetera. There's a long value chain, all right? I don't think this argument that you're going to make it in Whole Foods, not, not, with, not with this, not with corn. That might be great with vegetables, but that's not where the problem is. It depends on the product. So now, the product here is beef and, and chicken and meat. Well, there's a lot of other products in the grocery store. Let's continue this conversation a little less formally over some cocktails. I think Jason earned a glass of wine. Thank you so much for right. setting up tomorrow. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.